You're watching the video that the largest media corporation in Jamaica tried to take down from YouTube. Why, you might ask? Well, the video was called How Media Destroys Jamaica, where I did something that I hadn't seen anyone done before. I gave constructive criticism of the work of Jamaican local media by breaking down a few low-quality journalism examples. Unfortunately, some of these examples came from a television company called TVJ. Unfortunately for them, not for me. I personally don't have anything against TVJ. I wasn't picking on them. I was talking about news reports in Jamaica in general. I don't have anything against their journalists either. There are plenty of good journalists in Jamaica. Some of them are on TVJ and I really like their work. But obviously it was not that work I was criticizing in my short documentary. Anyhow, TVJ decided to take my video down with the help of claiming copyright over it because I used some of their footage. But of course, I was totally prepared for it. The original video will be restored by the 10th of September and I will make a full episode showing how anyone can win a legal case against even the biggest media corporation without spending any money. Until then, I'm simply re-uploading the video again with even more value added for my audience. For those who had managed to watch the original video before it was temporarily removed, check the timeline for the word new in the chapters to go straight to the added commentary without having to rewatch the entire thing. So, what was so special in that video that even the largest media corporation in Jamaica got worried? Who are the most powerful people in the world? You might think politicians, large corporations, business people, the rich. But what exactly makes them powerful? There is only one thing, the ability to influence public opinion. Mass media. It doesn't matter how much money you have. The media can turn anyone into a hero or it can also destroy anyone like that. That's why the most powerful people would usually invest their money to have control over some kind of media. But this channel is about Jamaica. And I have already covered in the last episode how foreign media misrepresents Jamaica and exposed a few tricks that journalists use. With this episode, we shall first focus on the most important question. Have you ever thought why bad news sells better than good news? As a journalist myself, I'm eager to share this insight with you and then showcase how local media destroys Jamaica. Until the beginning of the 20th century, the entertainment industry was quite limited and the main form of entertainment for thousands of years was, of course, public execution. Yeah, you thought it was music. No, let me remind you. In the past, hundreds of human beings would regularly gather on the main square and watch how other human beings are decapitated, hanged or burned to life. Humans like variety. And yes, it was popular across all societies, including the civilized Europe, especially the civilized Europe. I'm sure you all know that. But when you studied that part of history, did you ask yourself a question? Why thousands of people wanted to watch other people being killed? <laughs> Savages. But their answer is because of the same reason why millions of people are still doing it today. Films, computer games, an all-time favorite. TV news. You might think, this is not the same. You're just watching it to stay up to date. Are you? Once some kind of disaster happens on the other part of the planet, you watch it right away. Oh, so many dead people. This is horrible. Can't watch it. Oof. Any details? Oh, awful. So many people suffering. Definitely need to share with my friends. When you're driving a car and there is a really bad car accident, do you slow down and stick your hand out of the window to see if anyone's dead? And do you see other drivers doing that? Humans have such kind of behavior, not because they're horrible, but because of one reason, cortisol. Cortisol is a hormone that is produced by our body as a response to stress and danger. Also known as stress hormone, it's a natural reaction of our body to fear, our inbuilt mechanism causing fight or flight to save our life in danger. This is exactly the reason why bad news sells better than good news. Cortisol. Why? Well, because humans gain pleasure from the effects of this hormone and it can be quite addictive. This is how it works. You're getting this 
fear. And then an instant feel of relief. Because what you see is not happening to you. And yes, cortisol is like a drug. It makes you addicted. Not because of the fear, but because of the feeling afterwards. That's why there are people who like horror movies, action movies. And these are actually great as tools for stress relief. Because a healthy brain understands that the stories you watch or participate in are not real. And it uses this mechanism, fear relief to get rid of the stress. The problem comes when you watch real horror stories, like bad car accidents and the news about crime, especially if you do it on a regular basis. High levels of cortisol from this real stuff has long-term detrimental effects. It provokes anger and aggression. And this is when you start looking for someone to blame. It makes you feel hopeless and helpless, as if you have no other choice other than run or attack. If you feel that way, it's because there is something wrong with you and that something is being high on cortisol. As a result, you're craving more bad news to get that feeling of relief. It's the same as smoking cigarettes. Smoke a cigarette, get a feeling of relief, but at the same time create more craving for nicotine. That's why there will always be demand for bad news. And where there is demand, there is supply. Bad news is obviously the easiest way to sell a story. It's like having millions of drug addicts at your disposal and you're the one with the drug. But of course, some bad news sells better than other bad news. What you're about to see shows that the world you might think we're living in because of the media is not the world that actually exists. The study was done in the US, but it is a very good example for everybody. The first chart shows what Americans actually die from where heart disease and cancer are the leading cause of death, while the risk of dying from homicides or terrorists in the US is less than 1%. However, this is not the picture painted by the media. The last two charts are showing the share of media coverage by New York Times and The Guardian. And as you can see, these charts are remarkably similar. If you believe the media, you would be afraid of terrorism and homicides, while in reality, the biggest threat is unhealthy lifestyle and diseases. There hasn't been a research like this done specifically for Jamaican media coverage, but the real leading causes of death in Jamaica are known. They are the same as everywhere else, heart disease, cancer, and strokes. But I don't think this is the picture you get from local news. As somebody living in Jamaica, you probably hear more news about crime than anywhere else in the world. This in turn would make you think that there is more crime happening in Jamaica than elsewhere. I will be covering this topic in depth in a video called Is Jamaica Dangerous? So if you don't want to miss it, don't forget to subscribe and check your bell notification. But for now, is there more crime happening in Jamaica for media to cover when it comes to actual figures? Obviously not, because the population is rather small, not because Jamaica is safer. But the point I'm making, Think for a minute what would happen if local media in other countries decided to cover the crime in the same way Jamaican media does. There are over 1 million cases of violent crime happening in the United States each year. Imagine if all of them were reported in the media like it is done in Jamaica. It would be 2,963 stories per day. Okay, if we only stick to reporting homicides in the US, it would be only 38 stories per day. Look, I'm not picking on the US, obviously not. And yes, I know that US population is huge and we shouldn't compare the US with Jamaica, but I'm not comparing the countries. I'm comparing media coverage. And all I'm saying that if you were to publish every single crime story that is happening in the US, you would run out of space for headlines really fast. So how do they include everything in their national newspapers or TV? They don't. Crime stories don't make headlines unless it's something major or unusual. The chart we saw here only mention stories related to cause of death. But it doesn't include other things media covers in the US. So what are the top bestsellers that journalists are usually looking for? The number one is actually disasters, natural or man-made. Number two, war, terrorism and some protests. Then it's politics. 
injustice, all sorts of social issues, health issues. And only then, if you don't have the previous ones, you turn to the never ending source of news, your backup plan, crime stories. So if you're a journalist in a big country, there is way too much to report before you even get to crime. If, however, you're a journalist in Jamaica and you want a bestseller for your story, what are you going to write about? Natural disasters are rare in Jamaica. We don't have this kind of infrastructure for man-made disasters. You know, power plants don't blow up, buildings don't fall down. We don't have terrorism attacks, school shootings, political riots, at least not at the moment. Protests, clashes due to religion, clashes due to systematic racism, immigration issues, homeless people suffering on the streets with no food to eat, people suffering with drug addiction, epidemic of AIDS, women being discriminated at work. And the only social issues we do have that have to be talked about are related to LGBTQ communities and some controversial laws, like the law about abortion. They come up in the news from time to time, but most journalists in Jamaica try to avoid these topics entirely, because why bother when you can just focus on crime? This is just to explain why there is more news in Jamaica about crime than in any other country. This is not because there is more crime in Jamaica to cover, but because there is not much else to talk about that would make a fast and easy engaging story to sell. It's important to note, it's not like journalists are these evil people who want to manipulate the public. It's more like they don't have much choice. They're not free. The era of YouTube and social media is partially changing that, but when it comes to investigative journalism and high quality work, the problem largely remains. Who pays for it? Imagine you're a journalist. No matter how interesting your story is, if you're not getting any money to at least cover the cost of production of this story, it can work for some time, okay, but it's not going to be sustainable. No matter how independent you are, you're still limited by those who pay you. To a certain extent, YouTube allows independent journalism, but I'm still limited by YouTube policies. So I have to follow their guidelines. However, the situation is much worse when it comes to newspapers, radio, and television. I'm not talking about just censorship. It's about getting paid for your work. So I'd like to illustrate how different media covers the same news story depending on who pays for it. And then compare it with the way the same news would have been covered by Jamaican media. First, let's see the story as if it was covered by a more or less independent journalist paid by Google Ads. Yesterday, two men were shot as they were trying to break into a Happy Store supermarket at Green Street at 1 a.m. The witness claimed that the shooting was done by a person passing by in a private car who's now gone missing. The police reported that investigation is in progress and provided the number to contact them if you have any information. The supermarket will remain closed until further notice. Now the same news story, but reported by the media who is paid by the opposition to the current government. Pay attention, it's not fake news, same story, but how it is covered. Yet another shooting in the city as two victims ended up dead last night. Even the supermarket is no longer safe for our citizens. The police failed to arrive in time, which again certainly proves how inefficient the current reforms are. And it is clear the shooter is going to get away with it. Now the same news by the media that is owned by the government in power. Today, the president of our country came to congratulate the 10-year-old boy who won the maths competition for university students. This achievement is definitely the result of excellent education programs implemented by the government last year. The same news paid by the advertiser, who is a competitor of that supermarket in question. Happy Store Supermarket ended up not that happy for the two men who were shot dead by its entrance. The witness reported that it might be an inside job since the supermarket has been known for different scandals around its name before. The police is still investigating. As the supermarket in Green Street remains closed, the visitors are advised to visit the supermarket on Red Street instead. Supermarket on Red Street! And finally, how this news would have been delivered in Jamaica. 
The manhunt is on as gunmen went on a shooting spree while awaiting authorities. The murderers opened fire on two men who were peacefully minding their own business by the supermarket. As the bodies of two men were torn apart with bullets, the witnesses gasped in horror. The recent shootings show how the situation with crime is getting out of control in Jamaica. 930 persons have been murdered across the island up to Monday this week. This is 181 or 23 percent more than corresponding. Last year, 166 people were killed in St. James, 44 in Hanover, 87 Clarendon, 80 St. Catherine, 31 East Kingston, 54 St. Andrew, 61 Kingston West. You think I'm exaggerating the Jamaican news reporting? Sadly, no. Here. This is where in my first upload I provided some video examples from prime time news reported by TVJ with my commentary. I was not criticizing the TV company. I simply showed what exactly was wrong with their work by pointing out the things you're going to hear now. And the first video is called Shooting Spree in Montego Bay, Jamaica, published in June 2021. Quoting from the beginning of the video, a manhunt is on for four men who shot and injured seven persons in Jones Hall, St. James on Saturday. Gunmen went on a shooting spree by evading authorities. And we see the background picture, shooting spree in Mobay. The report continues with another journalist reporting, quote, The Jones Hall community in Montego Bay, St. James, was the scene of a series of shootings by four men Sunday afternoon. So the first question is, which one was it, Saturday or Sunday? Okay, you got the day wrong. But since when Jones Hall is in Montego Bay? Here's the map. This is Montego Bay. This is Jones Hall. One minute into reporting and they already have two accuracy errors. Look, this is not some YouTube vlogger like me. It's a TV channel. In case you're not aware, news report is written by the journalist, then is edited by the journalist, like proofreading for errors, then it's edited by the editor, and then it's read by reporters, two of them in this case. So all of these people were reading the story and they didn't see it? Obviously, they used Montego Bay in their report and the title of the video to gain more attention, which is even worse because it's a deliberate inaccuracy to manipulate the public. The second problem with this reporting, they disclosed details from the crime scene that should have never been made public. Quote, they reportedly opened a fire on the occupants of that vehicle, injuring three more persons who were rushed to hospital. All the injured persons are in stable condition. This is an example of unethical journalism. Disclosing such details of crime might harm investigation. But what's worse, it might put the lives of witnesses and those who were injured in direct danger. Most likely, people who were shooting from their car had no time to see what happened to those people they shot. But thanks to the news report, now they know. And if they wanted to track down the witnesses, journalists just helped them to do that. On top of all that, this new story is a straightforward fear promotion, which is done with the help of highly inappropriate vocabulary. It's not like they had to use it. They deliberately got creative with it to generate more fear and drama. Manhunters on, shooting spree while evading authorities. This is not an action movie. Using such vocabulary in official news report is irresponsible to say the least. The story is already tragic. Why make it even worse by trying to capitalize on this by creating this extra sensation? Here is another similar one from 2021 called Crime on the Rise, Murders Up 7% in Jamaica. The journalists show the actual police and military operation footage and expose the police positions so that suspects who the police was fighting against can now watch this video on YouTube and plan a better strategy to fight the police next time. Quote from the video, the barefaced and brazen actions of the thugs help to paint a grim picture of the country's crime problem. The choice of words. Perfect. For poetry, not news report. Come on. But that's not all. After their audience have watched the footage with the police operation and already got scared and the cortisol level is really high, the journalists say the following. Quote, 
critics suggesting that the government has failed to effectively manage the crime problems facing the country. There is time and place to criticize the government. It's part of the job and it's perfectly fine, but not in a video like this. This is a clear example of irresponsible journalism. They scare you first and then give you a hopeless scenario showing that the public, including you, are helpless. Considering what the video was about, this was the worst context to criticize the government. Basically, they're promoting their idea that bad guys are much stronger and can get away with everything while the government and the people of Jamaica are weak and can do nothing about it, which is not true. But hey, excellent message for the kids who are considering the career of the policeman who is weak according to them or a criminal who is strong according to them to terrorize their audience even more. See, I can also use these words. They take it a step further. In that very same video, they provide the statistics for the number of homicides in Jamaica by showing how many people were killed in every parish. My question here, why not provide the statistics of how many suspects were arrested by the police and do it by every parish? I've never seen that on national TV. Maybe I've missed it. Let me know. The ending of the video, quote, despite the increase in murders and shootings, other crimes are on the decline. Rape, robberies and break-ins are down by 34, 25 and 12 percent respectively. This is of little comfort to some citizens. The title of the video claims that crime is on the rise and then they contradict themselves at the end of the video by saying that the crime is actually on the decline, which is true. If you want to use the statistics, fine. Overall crime cases declined in Jamaica by 9.6% so far this year. Why don't they say that? Instead, they choose to add an opinion. Rape, robbery and break-ins are in decline, but this is of little comfort. No, this is of big comfort, especially for someone who could have been raped or robbed, but that didn't happen to them. Why does this kind of media make it sound as if those crimes are of less value or unimportant? Here's another video, this time from 2017, called Killing Caught on Camera in Westmoreland, Jamaica. The story begins, quote, A vicious crime caught on camera. The police are seeking your help to catch the killer. And before they start showing the footage, they also give a warning. If you're a parent, this video is not the kind of thing you want your children watching. But we're showing you, so if you know who this man is, help the police to find him by calling 119 or the nearest police station. When I heard this, I thought, okay, this is actually good reporting. They're going to use the footage from these cameras. And this is exactly how the media can assist the police to catch that person. But then I watched the rest of the video and I realized that they couldn't care less if anyone would be able to identify the person or not. Instead, they simply wanted to have an excuse to show a killing of a person on public television. How do I know? Let me explain first how such situation is properly done by the media. If the authorities decide to entrust this kind of footage to you, you only choose the parts of the footage where the suspect is visible, especially his or her face. Then you play these little bits of the footage again and again in repeat as you are reporting. You also have to choose the best frame to make a photo out of it, run it through software to balance out contrast and brightness for better visibility, and place that static image on the screen so that your audience have enough time to get a good look at the suspect and see if they can recognize the person. It's especially important on television where people cannot just pause the video. Obviously, you don't show the victim and the actual process of killing. This is not only unethical, but completely irrelevant relevant for the goal you're trying to achieve, which is to find the suspect in the end. What they did was completely the opposite. I'm not going to quote them directly, but what they show goes like this. Do you see a man on the left in an orange shirt? Take a close look at him because he is the victim and he will get killed now. Mm. The man on the right is the killer. Take a close look at his face. What, well, you didn't catch that? Well, too bad. Now, look how the man on the right is merging with the man on the left. And look, he's shooting him now. Well, we'll blur the picture. 
But we're still showing you the shooting, give you all the details of how it was exactly done, because without them, how would you be able to identify the face of that suspect? Yes, we will have to blur the image of the victim and the suspect during the killing, sorry, ethics, but we didn't blur the faces of the witnesses in that video, because why bother? So, Mr. Killer, feel free to see what they look like, our YouTube channel, at your service. And if you think that was it, nope. Remember the goal of the video was to help the police. So they thought the perfect way to do that would be to bring up the statistics again, because you never know. What if it helps to find the suspect? So at the end of the video, they're listing the number of homicides in every single parish again, just like I did in that Irene News example, except that they had the numbers all across the screen. It's not their fault all of this was happening. They were reporting the real story. It's their job. No problem. The question is, how? Well, what is the purpose of reporting these numbers to the public? What are people going to do with them? Oh, 87 victims in Clarendon and 44 in Hanover. Hmm, must be safer. Let's move my house there. 186 in St. James? Does that mean I have to lock my door now? And if it's 185, it's fine? And why are they misleading people with title Jamaica murder rate? These are actual figures, not the rate. At least they could have made an attempt to be accurate with the title when reporting statistics. Anyway, this story is from 2017, but they do the same thing several times a year on regular basis. And each time they present it as some kind of sensation. Jamaica has relatively small population, so even one extra homicide can make a significant difference in percentage fluctuation. Just wait for three days and the numbers are going to be completely different. That's why reporting this kind of statistics makes zero sense. The reality is that number of homicides in Jamaica this year is about the same as last year. Whether it's good or bad, it's irrelevant. It's just a fact. The good practice when reporting such statistics is to do it at the end of the year and with proper commentary from the specialist on the subject. Throwing numbers at the public without proper explanation and any context is just highly irresponsible. And for that story, it was also irrelevant. It's like when you're sending your child to school, okay, son, when you're crossing the road, make sure you look both ways. But wait, wait. You also need to know the statistics of how many children are killed by cars when they cross the road. Let me tell you for each parish. What is the purpose? But one of the main problems I've noticed that is specific to local media in Jamaica is that there is no clear distinction between proper media source and yellow press. In most countries, there will always be several sources of media. Some would have the reputation of being more accurate and of high quality, while others would be viewed as yellow press. Not so in Jamaica. Any media source you take here, it's like a mix of good press and yellow press. Take the Gleaner, one of the main newspapers. One page, accurate article, serious information, top quality journalism. Next page, complete nonsense story with no evidence provided, spiced up with spelling errors. The same for other newspapers, it's just really weird. Same thing for television or radio. You have Smile Jamaica on TVJ that has good journalists and feature interesting guests, like this episode with Samia Nkrumah, the daughter of the first president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, who was influenced by Marcus Garvey. Relevant, interesting and fresh. And then the very same company would feature absolutely ridiculous stories that represent such low quality journalism that I felt embarrassed watching it. I'm sorry in advance, but I'm going to show you one of the examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. And I didn't pick the worst one because the worst one is... Anyway, here is how your opinion about Jamaica is being formed by local media. And with this story, they don't even bother to add any evidence or anything. The story is called Abducted and Robbed in Jamaica that was published in April 2021. This story was published by TVJ during the prime time news at 7 p.m. when a lot of people were watching TV. First, we hear the introduction of the reporter and there is a background um, with a taxi sign and big letters saying abducted in a taxi. Quote, 
This evening, we share the story of one woman who was abducted in a taxi. Thankfully, she lived to tell the tale. And then a different reporter begins the actual story as the footage is being shown of Pegasus Hotel, Emancipation Park and other nice areas of New Kingston. Quote, it was May 2018. After leaving a youth conference at the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel in New Kingston, the journey home was not what Shakira and her four friends would have imagined. After a long wait for a taxi to halfway tree, one finally came. And then the journalist introduces the victim, who was abducted and robbed in a taxi according to them. For some reason, she's smiling and very happy as she's sharing the story. Here's what she says. It was a red plate taxi, uh, not a white plate. It was legal. And she thought she could trust the taxi. So for those who don't know about Jamaican route taxi, the type she is describing, the front row has one seat by the driver, the middle row has three seats and there is a door, and the back row has another three seats but there is no door. So people have to flip the back of the seat in the middle to squeeze in to the back. Quote from the victim, I slid in first and my friends, two of them went around to the back and then my other friend joined me in the middle row. So the lady says that two of her friends went to the back row while she and one more friend went to sit in the middle. So it was her and three friends. While the journalist a moment ago said it was her and four friends. Here is a quote. The journey home was not what Shakira and her four friends would have imagined. But then again, three friends, four friends, who cares? Inaccuracy is not the worst part of this story. Then Shakira continues by saying she wanted to send a message to her mother, but the guy next to her pulled out a gun. And this is where we want to hear more from the victim. But the reporter decides to silence his guest completely. And as we see footage of her face saying something, we don't know what, it is actually the reporter who is sharing her story for some reason. So let's see what he says, not the victim who he pretends to be interviewing, but the journalist. Quote, she didn't get to send that message to her mother as the gunman grabbed her phone. Shakira smiles a lot now, but being held at gunpoint, she recounts as the most traumatic experience of her life. How do you know? She never said that. And if she did, why didn't you include that footage and instead chose to put your words into her mouth? Here is what the journalist says, quote, the ordeal lasted for about 45 minutes. This is where it becomes obvious that neither the lady nor the journalist never been in a car robbery situation and didn't even bother to learn the basics of how it usually happens. The whole idea of stealing belongings from somebody in a car is that it has to be done really fast before victims even realize what's going on. So it doesn't usually take 45 minutes, more like 20 seconds maybe 30 seconds. The person committing that crime uses the situation while people are scared and confused, makes them unlock their phones, grab their phones and other stuff and runs out. 45 minutes. What was he doing for 45 minutes? Watching news on her phone? Next quote, again from the journalist. She says they were pushed from the vehicle and were able to walk to the halfway tree police station. Pushed from the vehicle? How? Remember, the bad guy was sitting in the middle row while her two friends were in the back row where there is no door. How exactly did he push them out of the car? Imagine in this traffic jam, the guy comes out of his seat with a gun. How do you flip that back of the seat? Excuse me, driver, can you, can you move the seat for me, please? I want to push them out. Yeah. And the other thing, what do you mean they were pushed out? Are you saying they wanted to stay in the car? <laughs> no, seriously, when you're making up a story, it should at least sound realistic or something. I mean, prime news on national TV. <clears throat> Questions to this reporter. Why did you post it now? It happened three years ago. That's not news. Why didn't you provide any evidence? At least you could have visited Halfway Tree Police Station and interviewed somebody there about the report made in 2018. And also, why not let us know about the investigation they have done so far? But you didn't. You just have a girl sharing a story which might not even be true. 
What was the point of that story? I would have understood if with the help of that story, you also brought up somebody who specializes in behavioral psychology to explain how people should act in these situations. What should people do in, if they find themselves in a car robbery? Or even better, how to prevent this from happening? Then it would have made sense. But no. When I watched this video for the first time, I had all these questions flooding my mind until I watched the end of the story. Quote, Thankfully for her and her four friends, their lives were spared and they escaped serious injuries. She says a more reliable and organized transportation system would help to make a difference. Tomorrow, we'll look at a new platform the Transport Authority is planning to roll out to heighten public passenger safety. Are you saying that this story is an advert for the new platform? Look, tomorrow we'll look at a new platform the Transport Authority is planning to roll out to heighten public passenger safety. Well, at least this explains why now and why the journalist controls the narrative. Even here, she says a more reliable and organized transportation system would help to make a difference. No, she doesn't say that. The journalist is saying that. He was also the one telling us about 45 minutes pushing out of the car and the police station. The girl never said any of that. We don't know what happened or if it happened at all. Anyway, whether this journalist was paid by Transport Authority to, I don't know, introduce the reasons for new platform or not, either way, he embarrassed himself, the TV channel, the lady he used for the interview, the transport authority, and he also gave bad reputation to route taxis and promoted the fear of crime. Forget the journalist. What about the editor? Um, this story is a complete bullshit. Yeah, tell them to put it on Prime News. Guys, please, this is just an example. It doesn't matter who that journalist is. It doesn't matter about his name or his personal life. I don't care, and neither should you. Because maybe he's a great journalist, but just had a bad day. Or maybe he's a nice person, but was forced to make this story. Good people can do bad things, and bad people can do good things. That's why I strongly believe that we should always judge the actions, the work of the person, not the person as such. The reason I decided to share this story and not some other embarrassing story, because this was a prime example of yellow press on national TV. Other stories are much worse, but at the end of the day, journalists are allowed to say whatever they want, right? Freedom of the press is sacred. As one person mentioned in the comments, if you don't like it, don't watch it. How convenient, isn't it? Imagine if a surgeon did that. Too lazy to do the research, analyze the situation, and then really didn't want to put all the effort while doing that and other surgery. So it didn't go well. And he's like, if you don't like my surgery, don't do it next time. For some reason, we're not okay if doctors get paid but don't do a proper job. But when journalists get paid and fail at their job, freedom of the press, freedom of speech. They can say whatever they want and I will defend their right to say it. This is where it's going to get dark really fast. What about those journalists who did propaganda for Nazism and said the Jewish people were not humans? Freedom of the press? What about those racist journalists in the US in 1920s who did those disgusting shows with blackface? Which one was it? Freedom of speech or freedom of the press? Freedom of speech means that you're allowed to express your opinion without being censored or restrained. But freedom of speech is not applicable to journalists because they get paid for what they say. And often what they say does not represent what they think or their opinion. That is why instead journalists have to follow the code of ethics. And this is exactly what differs professional journalists from, say, a vlogger on TikTok. The ethics of journalism includes the principle of limitation of harm. This is exactly why freedom of the press does not mean you can insult people or discriminate against them. Ethical media practice is important because of its high level of public impact. Sure, you can say whatever you want, in a pub or in a kitchen, 
But no, you cannot say whatever you want when you are an official media source. Not because somebody tells you not to, but because it's irresponsible. I've seen so many stories in Jamaica when there is crime investigation and you would have journalists walking around the crime scene and putting it on public television. What side are you on? A person who committed a crime would go, um, I wonder if I left my bandana there after killing that person. Oh, I know. Let's watch the news and find out. The police shouldn't disclose details of a crime, not because they're trying to hide something from the public, but because they need to investigate the crime. And by making these details public, journalists mess up their work. And how about running around taking interviews from the witnesses and making them public? Are you out of your mind? But there are things even worse than that. This is when journalists stick a camera into the face of a mother who just lost her child and go, what do you feel about it? You must be devastated. Got the camera going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What was his last word? When I saw this for the first time on Jamaican television, and there are actually a lot of examples of that, I couldn't believe that. And the worst thing, I saw the comments people were writing. Oh, poor mother, poor child. They don't even realize what's going on. As a journalist, you're not allowed to film a person who is going through tragedy simply because this person cannot make rational decisions, such as give you permission to film them. And if people don't get all these ethics, the reason it's not okay to film them, it's because it's making money at the expense of tragedy while abusing a person who is in the most vulnerable state. This is one of the worst examples of unethical journalism. If you put journalism in layers, there is quality journalism, top serious newspapers, documentaries and stuff, medium quality journalism like tabloids entertainment. Then there is yellow press with stories about celebrities, with I was abducted by an alien and now he wants to marry me. Then there is a line you never cross because under that line is a lot of trash. But under that trash is unethical journalism. But why? Why is that a problem anyway? Who cares about unethical journalism? And then the real problem is with crime. Well, it is directly connected. If you look at the map of the most free democratic countries in the world, and you will see that Jamaica is one of them. In fact, Jamaica is one of the leading countries when it comes to the freedom of the press. This is wonderful. But the press in Jamaica is so free that it can actually be scary. I'm not saying that the media has to be controlled. Obviously not. It's about to make sure that journalists who have all this power use it responsibly. Because honestly, I don't think Jamaican news reporters understand the consequences of what they're doing. They're adding these juicy words and catchy phrases and their stories are intentionally designed to create drama and make people feel fear, make you get your cortisol levels as high as possible. Do you know what happens next? Children in Jamaica grow up hearing the stories of crime all the time. Not all children, but a lot of them. As a result, from the very early age, Jamaican people develop this strong, overwhelming fear of crime. When these children become teenagers, this fear leads them to think there is not much choice, is there? You either spend your whole life being afraid of those bad men, or you become one of them. There are more choices, of course, way more attractive. But people who turn to crime are not aware of them. If you are a crime news reporter in Jamaica, you're contributing to this vicious circle. There is crime, you make the story about this crime in the most unethical manner possible. Instead of just informing people, this promotes fear of crime. Fear of crime makes people turn to crime, which results in more crime, and the circle repeats. Is low quality journalism responsible for crime in Jamaica? No, but it is one of the contributors. At the end of the day, low quality foreign media can report whatever they want about Jamaica. It's not their goal to ensure prosperity and Jamaican living a great life here. They don't care. They have their own stuff to worry about. Fair enough. But when it comes to Jamaican media, my question to Jamaican news reporters, if they happen to watch this, what are you doing?
You are creative, talented journalists. You have all this power and you use it to create horror stories to terrorize your own people? To sum up, the first problem with media is global, not just Jamaican. Delivering good news requires skills for it to go viral, whereas delivering bad news doesn't. It will go viral anyway because of human obsession with cortisol. The second problem is specific to the island. Jamaica is a relatively small society and there aren't that many bad things going on compared to other countries. And this contributes to the obsession with crime stories in Jamaica because there are hardly any other stories to talk about on a general level. But the third and most important problem, low quality local media contributes to the development of gang violence in Jamaica. And once again, I'm not blaming the media for gang violence. There are a lot of reasons why it exists. I'm just pointing out that local media, low quality local media, is one of these reasons. I totally agree that the media is free to choose any subject they want. And once again, sure, the media should report crime. It's their job. And I'm not criticizing them for what they report, but for how they do it. Lazy, boring, inaccurate, unprofessional, and unethical. Low quality journalism in a nutshell. At the end of this video, I'd like to share an important tip with my subscribers. Don't try to prevent your brain from craving bad news. The desire of fear and relief isn't built in our system in a form of cortisol and we cannot stop it. But there is a different way to cope with this. We need to replace the intakes of cortisol with more intakes of positive hormones, such as dopamine, oxytocin, and endorphins. Your body produces them when you learn something new, discover new things like travel to a new country, new area. It's a good kind of stress. Or watching educational videos. All of this produces dopamine. And if you do projects that bring positive feedback, help other people or animals without getting anything in return, this gives you oxytocin and makes you feel the bond or that you belong to somewhere. Watching a good comedy and positive videos will give you endorphins. Now, the beautiful effects of these hormones, you feel inspired, it empowers you, makes you creative. And instead of blaming others for all the bad stuff happening in the world, you start looking for solutions. It doesn't matter about your education, skills or knowledge. When it comes to these hormones, healthy human brains work in exactly the same way. Sure, journalists use various methods to influence people's opinions. I'm not an exception. And I really hope that this video does have an influence on your opinion. Otherwise, all this work was for nothing. Why am I exposing myself? <laughs> well, the methods themselves are not good or bad. It's how we use them. Thank you so much for watching. If you like my work, please do consider supporting this media project on Patreon for only five US dollars per month. And the special thanks is always to our top tier patrons for their continued support. My name is Irina and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.